what happens when we create machines that are as or more intelligent than we are? What are the possible timelines, implications, and ways forward to ensure we create the most positive future for our world? In this episode on responses to AGI, we look at how people and organizations around the world are responding to a future with much more capable AI systems and how we can look to even more effectively ensure a positive future with this technology. This is the AGI show, and I'm your host, Saroosh Paul. Robert Miles is our guest today. Uh, Rob is the host of the Robert Miles AI Safety Channel on YouTube, the single most popular AI alignment video series out there. Um, he's got 145,000 subscribers, and his top video has about 600,000 views, so way more than this show, and uh, I, I aspire to, to match those kinds of numbers someday. Um, he also goes quite a bit deeper than many of the series that are out there on, on any kind of AI safety topics, um, covering topics like the orthogonality thesis, inner misalignment, instrumental convergence. So he's not, he's not just stay, staying at the, the surface level, he's actually helping people get to that next level of depth, next, uh, next level of thinking when it comes to thinking about the future. Uh, through his work, uh, Robert, Robert has educated thousands on AI safety, uh, including those working on advocacy, policy, and technical research. Uh, his work's been invaluable for teaching and inspiring a generation of AI safety experts and deep, deepening public support in this area. I can sp say all this very confidently because I've watched Rob's videos and, and, and it's been part of my journey and have met others as well. Um, prior to the work he's doing now in AI safety education, uh, Rob studied computer science at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And I wanted to get him on the show here today to talk about um, his career journey in AI safety. You know, he, he, even though he's got a technical background, he's decided to go down a path that's, that's a little different to just simply technical research. He's gone down the path of education and advocacy. And I figured we've almost certainly got people in the audience who are in a similar boat, who uh, the way they'll most likely have an impact on the world of, of, of AI is through education and advocacy. So Rob is, 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 is someone who's actually done it, who's grown it to a significant um, audience and continues to do great work. So um, without further ado, um, welcome to the show, Robert. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we'll start with a, the, a simple one. Um, just want to hear a little bit about yourself. You know, what, what, uh, tell us a little bit about your story and, and how you got into AI safety. Uh, yeah. How did I get into AI safety? I guess I, well, I read, uh, I read a bunch of Yudkowsky mm. is the long and short of it. Um, uh, yeah, the, what actually happened was I just got a Kindle. Uh, this was 2010, I guess, somewhere around there. Um, and this was like new and exciting. I could carry all my books around with me. Um, and I remember having a rule, which was that if I ever randomly stumbled across three separate pieces of work by the same person that I thought they were all excellent, I would then try and read everything that that writer had ever written. That is um, ambitious. I like it though. Yeah, that's the power of being an undergrad, I guess. Um, <laughs> and the power a, of actually wanting to do something like that, which is which I don't think is super common. That's awesome. Yeah, I guess. I just I was very excited to be able to read so much at the time. So, um, yeah, this triggered with Yudkowsky pretty quickly. I don't, I stumbled across three random things, uh, through, I don't know, Hacker News or something. And, uh, right. and he's prolific. He's, he's written a lot. He's very prolific. Actually, and I, I still we, haven't. On your point about reading everything he's done, I was going <laughs> to say he's, that's good. That could be a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of material and I, I didn't, I didn't successfully read everything he ever wrote, but I, I made an attempt. I downloaded this um, ebook that was just like a compilation of everything he ever posted to Overcoming Bias and Less Wrong at that point um, and just kind of read that beginning to end. And it wasn't, it wasn't difficult. It sounds like it would be difficult, mm -hmm. um, but it's not because it's a series of short blog posts, you know, and each one is kind of self-contained. It's like, like the digestible pieces. Exactly. And... Uh, the, the other reason it was easy is that I didn't realize how long it was <laughs> because it's a Kindle, right? I just right, started right, right. reading. You just, kept, you just kept clicking. And then, you know, 
some months in or whatever, I'm like, I've been reading this book for a while now. <laughs> what do you do? You know what ballpark? How many pages were in this book? Yeah, so I looked it up. I mean, I basically I realized when I was seventy five percent of the way through, like, hmm, I've been going for a while, and so then I did a word count uh, on the file and found it was a million words. Well, I don't know uh, what that, what does that compare to for a regular book? Do you know? Um. How does it compare? Let's see. Let's just do a quick, quick Google. Let's, well, what's what's Infinite Jest? Yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice fat book. Right. It's basically like two Infinite Jests. Um, two Infinite. Okay, so two, for for audience members who haven't seen a copy of Infinite Jest, I've got one sitting in my bedroom. Two copies of Infinite Jest is like, you know, it is probably twelve <laughs> inches wide. It's 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 big. It's a lot. Very solid estimate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did that same calculation. Um, I pulled a paperback off my shelf, counted the number of words on a page uh, at the size I was reading the Kindle. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because I was reading it like somewhat larger than you would print something like Infinite Jest, yeah. um, the book I was reading was effectively two feet thick. Yeah. Um, Insane. <laughs> insane yeah exactly but well, you don't so, notice well, you, you don't well, you must have been enjoying yourself that's that's the part that's surprising but yeah um, something yeah. that long uh, it was like uh, they're not all bangers but like pretty <laughs> consistently each of those each of the things i read was like uh an interesting idea that i hadn't thought much about before um awesome okay so you read the not even the collected works, one of the extended works <laughs> of Eliezer Yudkowsky, the way other people read uh, George R. R. Martin, which is, which is impressive. Okay, so right. what, 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 where, where did that take you? Um, and then, and then I don't know, that, that just made me think like, oh, okay, I think I understand the basic outline of like why we have a problem here. Or at least why we might have a problem. So by this point, he had already been writing about uh, AI safety in these in this particular publication. Uh -huh. um, in yes, sometimes fairly directly. Um, and so, like the basic case for AI risk um, seemed again at that point. I wasn't like, oh yeah, this is definitely correct, and I'm going to make this my life. But I was like, damn, this is big if true, right? right. This, is very, right. this is very interesting. This is something I want to look in, into more. Um, and I also was kind of, um, I was kind of directionless uh, at that point. Um, not in a way, yeah, you know, it's not really a problem to be directionless. You're, you're, an, undergrad. you're an undergrad, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's common. I was always, always, you know, quantitatively minded and... Um, Always enjoyed science, yeah. So, mm. so that's Although actually what I used to say was as a kid, I used to say, "Oh well, the job I end up doing uh, probably doesn't exist yet." Oh, that well, that's was my like smart ass thing to say. Well, you know, I think that's a quite a a rare wise thing to say as a as a child because most kids don't think like that. Most kids think here are the categories of things, and I would be one of them. Um, you know, that's that's Maybe. quite a. That's a quite a late career thing to realize that actually but the world is not. it wasn't coming from, it was, it was, in a sense, it's like, ah, yes, this kid is very wise and thinking about the future. Actually, I think it was kind of an excuse to not think about the future. Um, like, well, who knows? The future is very mysterious, you know? Um, it's not, it's, it's, it's very unfair how correct that ended up being. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, awesome. So tell me, so at this point, okay, you've now, you've developed an interest in AI safety. Um, at which point do you actually start to, to put, take some meaningful steps towards creating something or, or contributing something? Yeah. So in my vague direction towards like become some kind of scientist, I now have a thing that's like become some kind of scientist who helps with AI risk somehow, yeah. right? Um, and I'm already on track, like I'm already studying computer science, so this is not far out of my way. Yep. So then when I was offered a, um, a position to, uh, in a PhD program, yeah. um, I was like, yeah, sure, perfect. Makes sense, next step, computer science PhD, that's on the career path for scientists who helps with AI safety. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, but this was 2011, right? Yeah. Um, so there wasn't much, uh, you know, I was studying AI, but it was not, uh, like neural networks stuff. Um, right. Was, like uh, at least in the universities, I mean, people would have been, I forget the exact timeline for deep learning, but people would have been. Oh, there were people learning. working on it. Yeah. But it wasn't an assumption that if you were doing a PhD in in AI that it would automatically involve. Right, right, right. People were still debating more about which paradigms and things in a, in a way that's diminished significantly since. Right, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so I was working on that. And, uh, and it, wasn't, it wasn't safety related PhD work at all. Right. I just thought, you know, this is the prove that you can do research, get your foot in the door, become a researcher and then try to do. Uh, right. At this point, you're there. really just, just trying to get yourself into, into uh, AI itself. And, you know, there were no, there were almost no like supervisors for safety work, I don't think. No, I mean, 2011, uh, super intelligence was still three years from being published to the best of my memory. Um, right. You know, this was very, you know, yeah, we didn't, obviously we didn't have anything. We didn't have open AI. We didn't, we, I think maybe DeepMind would have existed. Yeah, but I don't but know. DQN was later. So nobody yeah. would have heard of them. Right, exactly. Like their, their level of actual impact would have been still quite low. Um, and certainly most people weren't even thinking about this problem. Eliezer was obviously one of the, one of the early uh, people in the modern era to be talking about this stuff. Mm. Uh, also, I'm not totally sure of the dates. It may have been 2012. Sure. But still, either way, it's still quite early. So, so I'm yeah. doing this PhD. Um, and it's actually not going very well. No, 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 no. I was not, um, I'm not really cut out for PhD work psychologically. Um, it's quite, uh, it's quite isolating. Uh, it's difficult to work on something that almost nobody else cares about. It's also difficult to work on something uh, for me, at least something that I, uh, I ended up like not believing in the usefulness of. Sure. Sure. I, like, that I believed I can... it was. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely relate to. I mean, I think a lot of people can. It's like novel and publishable and so on. But um, yeah, I don't know. It made me realize I'm actually more of an engineer that like if something's not state of the art, if people aren't going to actually use it in preference to other things they could be using, then it's less, um, it's difficult for me to get the motivation that you need to like bang your head against this thing yeah. day in, day out on your own. I think you've just highlighted, yeah, like a, yeah, a difference. Actually, I say a lot of people, but you're right. There are different types of people. And, you know, some people really like playing with ideas that are quite far from, from being realized or scaled up or, or used. It's it maybe, in fact, sometimes they optimize for things that are just like way on the edge of knowledge in a way that makes it very unlikely to be kind of adopted for quite a while. Um, but yeah, others like myself, and it sounds like you as well, definitely that, that, that the chance for it to be actually applied seems to be quite important. And that's only a subset of uh, PhDs out there, probably a, a relatively small subset. Yeah, and I think the other thing is I didn't, I didn't have like such a clear vision uh, like I could imagine being really, really driven to be like, I am going to work on safety as a, you know, a doctor of computer science and, um, I need this. And so, although I don't really, in- I'm not intensely motivated by this specific work, but right. I know that this is a hoop that I have to jump through and I'm motivated to do what it takes to jump through that. That's never been my psychological makeup. If the thing directly in front of me is not engaging, I have a hard time with it. Right. You can't, you can't treat things like a means to an end or, or have that kind of like, it's eight hops to the final outcome. That's just not as motivating for you. Yeah. I mean, I can. Yeah. But might be able to not for the years at a time. Right. right? Like right. You, it's not sustainable to, to put in that kind of willpower. Okay. Um, that, that was still, uh, that was still very interesting because I know there's, 
people out there considering or starting a PhD or in, 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 in similar situations. But tell me what happens next. So you're in this PhD, you kind of know it's not, it's not for you. Oh, yeah. Um, and so one of the things that happens in the computer science department of the University of Nottingham is this YouTube channel, Computer File, mm -hmm. um, which is part of the number file, 60 symbols, the, the Brady Aaron expanded universe. Um, and yeah, the way that works is Sean Riley, who runs the channel, um, goes around the computer science department at mm. the University of Nottingham uh, talking to people about their research um, right. and makes these really great videos that are kind of in-depth interviews with researchers about what they're working on. That's, and I'm not, kind of I'm, half... I'm, I'm not aware of this. Is this a particularly popular series or like a big series out there? Like that yeah, is... yeah. Oh, okay. uh, so at the time it was fairly big and now, yeah. I, now I would call it very big. I think it's several million subscribers now. That's fantastic. So yeah, check especially that time frame, it must have been on the earlier side of these kind of YouTube science educational series. Oh yeah, absolutely. 2.3 million subscribers now. Yeah, for a, for a science podcast, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's, really, um, good. it's really a great channel. Yeah, because it's real experts being interviewed at sufficient length to really explain things, but done very clearly and with like helpful animated, you know, diagrams and, uh, and all of that. It's a great resource. Huh. Um, and yeah, I was, I bumped into Sean, um, in the queue for a, for a barbecue because, you know, free food. And I was a PhD student. <laughs> As you did. Yeah. And I said, oh, hey, you're the guy who does those videos. I have, maybe I could say, you know, I got some stuff I could talk about. Um, and the first one I did was actually about cryptography because I was kind of interested in cryptography at the time. And I'd come across a particularly intuitive explanation of public key cryptography. Oh. Um, so that was the first one I did. Awesome. But then um, I realized like, yeah, you know what? All of, this, uh, all of this AI stuff I've been reading doesn't seem to be widely known. So I may as well, yeah, explain that. Nice. So you just did the one video for this, this other group before you started recording your own videos? No, I did a few. Um, I started, so like, yeah, while I was at Nottingham, um, I, I just sort of started going through the basic concepts of AI safety or of AI risk, I suppose. Um, and yeah, people liked those videos. Yeah. Have you um, gone back and uh, watched them now? And, and and if so, what are your thoughts on them? I'm so curious about people going back to their early works. Yeah, my uh, hair was pretty great. <laughs> did you have I the beard? That. Did you have the beard at the time, which has become a trademark? No, no, it's sort of inverted. Mm. I had no so your lo beard your logo, kind of your Rob Miles logo, would have been all off. No, yeah, the logo is the logo is accurate. That's how I used to be. I used to have a bunch of hair. And I used to wear a hat. It was not a great look. Um, Does the logo not have a beard? I thought I definitely saw the logo beard. logo doesn't have it. a beard. No, that's oh, hair. Oh, really? oh, that's hair. Yeah. So, so my, my, my impression uh, of it is like, yeah, I pretty much stand by it. Most of it. Um, nice. Like it's such basic stuff. Right. It's, such, it's so sort of fundamental mm. that um, it's hard to get it badly wrong. And also um, that's always going to be... It's a lot of it is stuff that's kind of kind of true by definition or something. Okay. Um, I'm, like, cool. I'm glad. I'm glad the not always the case that the early forays to work out. So I'm glad in this case they they stood the test of time. Yeah, I think so. It's like they're definitely true if you grant the premises and like I make I do lay those out. And so uh, if 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 some of these assumptions underlying assumptions end up not being true, then the thing isn't true. But um, the logical structure is valid, you know. This sounds, this sounds a lot like the world of AI safety <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, so you've now just started creating videos. Um, did you get, did you get um, early traction? Like when you were putting out videos, did you, were you getting much uh, viewership and things or did it take quite a while? Yeah, I mean, because they're just channels, that, because they're just videos on this existing channel, uh, which was already 
popular. So AI um, safety videos went on this um, existing University of Nottingham groups channel. Yeah, oh, okay. it's well, not actually great. like, it's not officially university affiliated. Yeah. Um, it's just like, that's where. Sure. That's but it was affiliated grounds. with this this existing channel. Yeah. And the especially the early stuff was pretty dramatic compared to a lot of the other stuff on the channel, right? Mm. It's like, here's, you know, um, this professor is talking about like how the PDF format came to exist, which is like interesting. But then it's like, and here's Rob talking about why AI might kill everyone. <laughs> it's like, obviously on YouTube, that's going to like, do well. Right. And, and I guess, yeah, it's, you know, it's different to be like, you know, a lot of times when you go deep into this field, you start to just get very stuck in the, 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 like the specific techniques and the specific problems and you, but the early stuff of like why people got into it is because of the scary possible outcomes. And so those yeah. scary possible outcomes are very attention grabbing. Right. Although, yeah, I'm not really talking about like, a lot of the time people get really specific about the outcomes mm. and that I think is much less interesting than the mechanisms by which those outcomes happen. Mm. Like, uh, I, I would rather have a detailed explanation of why the outcome is bad than a detailed explanation of how bad the outcome is. Right. Mm. Um, in the sense of just like, Hey, this is, this is why we have a problem. This is why we expect AI systems to do pretty dramatically bad things by default. Yep. And then the specific question of exactly what bad things they do is like actually not that relevant to the, the framing of the problem. Right. I think, I mean, definitely depends on kind of who you ask, obviously, as far as kind of what, what gets their mind most engaged and, and most relevant. But it sounds like for you, you are more interested in the the logic and the assumptions and the pathways than so much the specifics of, of the end states we might get to. Yeah. I just think that like, I don't know, like I can talk you through all of the injuries that might happen to you as your car hits the bottom of a cliff. Mm. Right? I'm like, well, probably you would like break your head against the steering wheel. And then also the car would catch fire. And then also, you know what I mean? And like, I'm just like, hey, I would rather explain how we're driving towards a cliff and how we might steer away from that cliff. That's like the relevant thing in this situation. Um, all I need to all I need to say is like, hey, we're going to go over that cliff and that's going to be bad in ways that you can imagine for yourself if you want to. Right? Yeah, I think I think what you're saying makes sense. And I think you've engaged, you know, 150,000 plus people um, with, with, with things that you're really interested in. I do wonder if um, people do resonate and respond to quite different messages and if others don't. Because I think one of the, 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 the things I often hear, and, I, and even when I'm trying to talk about AI safety, I, I hear this, is like people have a hard time imagining what this bad thing looks like or what concrete, versions of this bad outcome look like so i think maybe um different versions of this story may resonate with different people but you're certainly yes. right that um that the, you for you and and for for hundreds of thousands of others what you're describing was was what really resonated and it feels as though that's the important thing the important skill or something mm. is not the ability to actually imagine viscerally what it would be like if the whole world is destroyed by AI, mm. but the ability to not have to viscerally imagine it, right? The ability to just realize that it would be bad and act on that anyway, even if your, you know, emotional brain is like not capable of wrapping its head around literally everyone dying. Right. Um, there's something, there's something about that. It feels like there's a particular, maybe it's a kind of person or maybe it's just a skill, but like people who can be moved to action by arguments. Yeah. With I feel like visceral emotional component being an optional extra on top of that. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's one way or the other. 
um, I think about like a good analogy here might be something like climate change. You know, some people look at climate data and trend lines and that's all they need to see. They're like, oh, we got to act. Um, but for a lot of people, and I would probably uh, posit like m most people, uh, they they really need to think about, oh, this is, this is, you know, sea levels rising and towns going underwater. This is, you know, people being displaced from their homes and, and becoming refugees that need to move, you know. So I think that emotional storytelling can be quite powerful. And then even on in terms of action, obviously people people will need to act in different ways. Maybe maybe there's a scientist that needs to think in a really clear-headed way and and generate trend lines, but there's probably a whole lot of other people who need to do other types of work for, for the transition to be successful. Yeah, yeah. There's two things I would say about this. One is um, that I was starting from a place of this is a technical problem that calls for technical solutions. And so uh, it's not obvious what you can do about the problem if you're not a technical person. Mm. Um, and therefore, I could like cause a bunch of people to freak out. And this is like basically net negative um, because you've made their lives less pleasant. Yep. And they're not in a position to really do anything about it anyway. So, like, how how is that doing them a favor? Right. Um, and I've shifted somewhat on that in recent years. Yeah. Um, as it becomes more obvious how how much political uh, activity is needed to get the conditions we need in order to solve the technical problem. Um, but that was not people will say that was always obvious. And I don't think that's true. I, I think I, I agree with you, by the way, on this, because even a year ago when I joined, uh, like full time AI safety type work, uh, this was not obvious in the in the common co in the uh, discourse. And even in my own thinking, I wasn't you know, 100% sure of this. So I think you're definitely right. That this was not obvious. Yeah, but I also think I, I was making a mistake. There is a mistake that's easy to make, which is when a particular point is made to you in a bad way mm. by people who don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it's easy to update too strongly against that position being true. Mm. Um, whereas in fact, you know... Um, the world's, if the world's most optimistic person comes to you and says, oh, what a glorious day it is, that doesn't mean that it's a bad day, right? It just means, yeah, yeah this person is super biased and they will always say um, that it's a beautiful day. But like you can look at, you can actually look at the sky, you can look at the sun and the clouds and be like, huh, no, actually, yeah, you're not right for the right reasons, but like, yeah, it's a nice day today, correct. And so, like, I had a lot of people come to me and say, oh, but this is all, what about the politics of it? This is all politics. And that was coming from almost exclusively, I contend, a place of, like, but I don't know how to think and talk about technical things. I know how to think and talk about, like, people. Mm. And I'm uncomfortable when we're not talking about my particular thing. Right. Um, and I want to shift this to be in an area of conversation that I'm happier with, right? Sure. And this happens obviously on both sides. Yeah, I was going to um, say, I was going to say, I was just going <laughs> to argue, are you sure this wasn't happening to you? <laughs> that you weren't on the yeah. other side being like, actually, I, I'd really much rather keep talking about the technical stuff. But I think the difference is that like, when people are working on policy, when people are working on, um, on, on the politics of it, I'm not coming along and saying like, oh, no, you should just, you should, you know, but what about the technical stuff, right? I'm just like, yeah, you but do that, I'm going to do this. But maybe back in the day you were, maybe when you're, that, you're in that one-on-one -on -one conversation, which I know is different to a, a group of policy people talking about it, but in that one-on-one -on -one conversation, you were, you were pulling one way and they were pulling the other way. In, when oh, in yeah. fact, yeah. I would definitely be like steering a conversation towards the type of stuff that I more enjoy talking about. Right. Yes. But I wasn't advocating that other people um, right. 
change Don't what they do were it. doing or suggesting that they're missing the point or something like that. Yes. Um, yeah, having that, there are actually uh, multiple points. Yeah. That humility is, is actually quite important. And anytime people get too, too dogmatic about how to do things, it, it usually can be quite problematic. And also just division of labor, right? Mm. Like I know, I, I think I know what I'm good at and other people know what they're good at. And it makes sense for us to work on different things. Right. The correct approach involves multiple things. You don't have to be putting down other people's work, right? Yep. 100%. There's no point in that. 100%. I think there's just, there's a type of person or type of situation where certain uh, types of thinking or work get undervalued. And that undervalued can, can lead to, yeah, either criticism or discouragement or lack of resources or anything. Yeah, you know, think of like yeah. organizations that are full of engineers and then all of a sudden like they really undervalue like good marketing or good design. And then an Apple, yeah. Apple comes along and you're like, oh, maybe this hardware really could have been good looking and, and, and really dramatically changed the way people use it from the get-go. You know, that sort yeah. of idea. But like they didn't cut back on their engineering is the thing. No. Like they're still... Decently engineered systems. Definitely. Um, I think there's a the second thing, yep. which is about um, that I wasn't actually thinking very much about my audience specifically in the early stuff, especially. Um, and I actually think that was the correct thing to do. I think that a lot of the really, really bad stuff that's out there, bad material that people produce, comes from. Um, targeting an audience that you don't understand really deeply and intimately. Um, yep. And a lot of the time this gets rounded off to like disrespecting your audience. And that's a big part of it. Uh, sure. Underestimating your audience, whatever. But basically anything where you're like, ah, I'll do such and such. Cause people always, you know, I'm sure that people will like that. Um, whereas for me, my audience is always myself, right? Right. I'm right. trying to make something what, what that I, I find hear? interesting. Right. Um, and the downside of this is not everyone is like me. But the upside of this is I have a really, really good, clear signal. I can immediately look at something and tell with high fidelity whether a person like me would like this thing. Right. Because yep. yep. I have direct access to that. Um, and that, it turns out, in my experience, a precise and low latency model of something which other people are similar to is much better than an imprecise model of what other people actually are. Yep. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of comedians are like this as well. They're just like, well, it makes me laugh. So I'll put it out there. Oh, Trying to come up with something that like you don't think is funny, but you think other people will think is funny. is like, that's a disaster. Don't even try. This is exactly um, the advice that uh, people like Y Combinator will give for making products. You know, like I, the absolute ideal setup is that you are your own customer. You are building something that you wish existed and does it. The next right. best might be like you've got like a family member or someone you really care about who needs the thing. Um, and then if the worst someone you know is, really well, yeah. Exactly. And then the next best is you just work really, 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 really hard to understand your audience. And then the much more common and, and often the failure mode is you just don't understand it. You don't care about the, the, the audience or the customer and you make something that people don't actually want. And yeah, I mean, a show, uh, educational content is also a product, something people consume. Right, right. And so there's like a strategic argument that I could make, but it's post hoc. And that, that argument is like, well, we want people who could work on the problem and that kind of person is more interested in the technical side of things. So I'm going to make technical content to encourage people to become researchers. Uh, I think that, I think that if that were my reason, it would be an okay reason, but in practice, that's not my reason. I'm making stuff that I would like and people like me, uh, naturally would like that as well. So let's zoom out a little bit. Um, tell me a little bit about, so did the show from there grow pretty kind of linearly over time? Was it something where it went in starts and stops in terms of audience growth or your own um, ability to produce it? How was this, the journey from there? Um, yeah, so after a while I dropped out of the PhD 
Um, I worked in industry briefly for like a year or so because mm. I was just trying to get away from academia as mm. far as I could. I ended up working in, in, in financial software. Okay. Um, which, yeah, I worked with good people, but the clients were not good. Mm. Um, and I didn't have a feeling like I was really helping the world, right? Um, so, yeah, then I was like, and that whole time I was still making computer file videos from time to time. Um, and, then, and then I was like, well, I guess I'll start my own channel. Um, and I was very fortunate that because of computer file, I had this like pre-made audience. Yep. Um, I was able to start my own channel that was doing pretty much the, exactly the same thing that people had seen me do on computer file. So there was already a, a decently sized audience that just like knew exactly what I was about. Um, so when I started the channel, I just like mentioned it in the next computer file video that I did and it immediately got to a uh, like reasonable size. Um, I think I hit a thousand subscribers before I hit a thousand views oh, total wow. on the channel. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't happen usually That's <laughs> right. for a long time. Because there were enough people who were like, oh yeah, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'll just click subscribe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, anything exactly. Rob does, I, I subscribe. Like... Uh, it's at least worth checking out, right? Yeah. Um, and so then as for actual growth, I was aware, I did a bit of thinking and reading about like, oh, okay, if I'm going to make being a YouTuber my job, what does that look like? And one of the things people say is like, you get obsessive, you get tunnel visioned on the metrics. You're in. You like good heart audience capture, you kind of lose yourself. You're like, right. you're like following this, this, this gradient of what gets more views and you become clickbaity and you spend all of your time looking at graphs right. and, um, you know, you become like a, a, a shell of your former self. Yep. It's a classic, you know, you sell out to, to, to maximize audience that you hear about in all kinds of media roles. Right. And so I decided pretty aggressively early on that I was just going to make stuff that I thought was good and like not pay attention to the metrics, basically. Right. I was going to be like, okay, do I think it's good? Do I enjoy it? Do I think it's useful and important? And then duh, what does the field think, right? Like when I talk to researchers, do they think that my stuff is accurate? Do they think that it's helpful? Do they think that I'm covering relevant material? Um, and the numbers, obviously you can't help but notice yeah. view counts on videos or whatever, but yeah. I like deliberately uh, de-emphasized them in my like mental accounting. Nice. Um, and like, I think, I don't know. I think I went too far. <laughs> okay. This is I think good. my channel could be a lot bigger <laughs> if I had allowed uh, the metrics in a bit more than I did. Right. Um, it's difficult to find that balance. I'm like that with Christmas. Okay. Weirdly. I'm usually, or at least the past, there were years when I was absolutely sick of the idea of Christmas by the time it actually happens. Okay. And that's miserable, right? Because they start in like October. Right. And it's endless. And they're like, I don't mind a bit of Christmas, right? You know, I don't mind a nice cup of tea. I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not following the analogy. What's the analogy between this and your metrics? I don't want a <laughs> fire hose of tea aimed at my face, right? But I like a nice cup. So this is, okay, you just saying- I haven't got like, to the point yet. You like, you like things in moderation, <laughs> metrics t and i have Christmas. a point is that the point or is this something no else? no it's an extended it's a it's a it's, <laughs> it's an extended double layer metaphor okay don't expect it to make sense yet no. so <laughs> the point is it used to be i would avoid christmas stuff as hard as i possibly could okay and then i found that by the time christmas came like enough of it sneaks through right yeah sometimes yep. you're in a shop you can't control what's going on and they're playing yep. Christmas music on the, over the thing, yep. whatever, that's fine. Not non-consensual that like, Christmas, yep. Right, right. And I found that the, the amount of like non-consensual Christmas that I got was like about the right amount for me. 
<laughs> so that was my thing was that I would like push it out as hard as I could and that would end up right. with like a healthy dose. Right. Um, but then now, as uh, just like in the last few years, as I have more control over my own life and like I'm working from home and uh, all of this, I found actually I'm genuinely able to fully exclude Christmas or like almost exclude Christmas. And then when Christmas comes, I'm like, huh, you know what? I actually didn't get quite enough of that. I could stand <laughs> to have a little more. I'm a little bit disappointed. It's so like when yeah, I had yeah, that yeah. level of control, it was too yeah. much. And I think okay. basically it's like that. I think that I was more able to lock out the good hearting and the metrics than I expected to be able to. And so right. I overdid it. Um, right. The amount of like understanding metrics that just snuck in anyway was probably not enough. And I should have actually been paying a little bit more attention um, right. Right. to what so, was doing well. So or, it's, yeah. it's kind of like the, it, so your, your journey was uh, you don't want to be a sellout. You don't want to build kind of empty, lifeless stuff that just seems to get clicks. But maybe you swung too far in the other direction. And if you could have your time again and maybe looking forward, you're going to let in a bit more of the, the metrics data driven uh, side of things because you also do care about, you know, more people getting to see your show and, and yeah, engaging with it. I think I could have reached a lot more people. Um, I think. And the other thing is like, yeah, there, there are trade offs here. But, um, and I think I was not. I was not at the Pareto frontier. I think I could have taken a sort of a 1% hit in um, sort of genuineness or quality or something mm. and taken like a, I don't know, a, a, a multiple percentage increase in like virality. Right. Um, and that turns into, that's like exponentially maps onto view count. So I could right. have actually got a lot more views without sacrificing very much, yep. I suspect. Yeah. Everyone um, knows that the ideal amount is 30% sellout. Is so it? What, 70% genuine, 30% sellout. Yeah, that's what I'm calling for okay. personally. By runtime or <laughs> how are you measuring that? Because uh, if, how... if I do 30% like asking people to subscribe, that's going to yeah. be a rough video. It, it's, it's by it, when I walk into a room full of AI safety researchers, how many eye rolls I get. If 30% of the room is eye-rolling me, then I know I've just nailed it. Oh, wow. I couldn't handle that. That's the thing. I, I, don't, want a, I don't want a single eye-roll. Okay, okay. Um, They'll come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, and actually, I, that's, that is, now that I think about it, that is impressive, isn't it? For, by the way, for, for anyone listening, this is definitely not true, and you can tell that I'm not true by my low subscribe account. <laughs> That's how you know I'm oh, clearly okay. not optimal. I'm, I'm definitely right. not on the brain. I'm not frontier. even trying. You don't even know what my subscriber count would be like if I was trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm just saying I'm nowhere near the Pareto frontier for, for anything like that. <laughs> yeah, no, same, same. All right, all right, all right. I'll bring things back to AI safety a little bit at least, um, although that right. was a fun, fun, fun way to think about uh, the metrics world. Um Awesome. Um, let's, let's zoom forward a little bit. Um, Rob, what are you working on now? What am I working on now? Well, I'm, I'm trying to make videos still. Okay. This last year has been, I say, yeah, these last several months have been rough for making mm. videos. I found it very, very difficult to, to create anything that I'm happy with. Mm. Um, uh, basically like I've always struggled with perfectionism. Yep. Um, and that problem has got way, way worse as the AI situation becomes more and more like serious and, uh, uh. and gets more attention. Uh. Um, you know, when the channel was small, I could just be like, I mean, I'm exploring these ideas. I'm having fun. I'm explaining things and it's chill. It doesn't matter. Right. Right. And then once the channel got bigger, it was like, okay, well, I am the biggest AI safety channel. So like, maybe this matters. Right. And that brings the, um, that brings the standards up. Right. Yep. But at the same time, it's still small. It's not like, it's still kind of a, uh, an obscure field of computer science. And so like, I think it's really important, but like the world at large doesn't. And so I still get to just kind of play around and have fun with it. 
And now it's like, if I make a video, there's like a chance that that really makes a difference, something. And this yeah. is like why I'm not psychologically an effective altruist or whatever. That like, I think that a lot of people, they're like, oh, a chance for impact. That's exciting. Uh, I, I really want to do that. And was like, wow, this is a chance to really screw up on a large scale. Right, right, right. I, it becomes, <laughs> once you start to think about it in terms of the scales, it becomes a little bit uh, self-defeating or, 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 or more of a block. Yeah, at least for me, yeah. psychologically, it's not healthy to think about what I'm doing as important. Yeah. Um, but I also can't avoid it at this point. Like, I've always said, I think AI safety is the kind of the only important thing happening right now. Um, but I always said that in kind of a vaguely contrary, like it, not expecting the person I'm saying it to, to like actually agree with me or something right. like that. Right. Um, and when it's just like accepted that like, yep, yep, there's kind of only one important thing happening this century and it's like the AI situation. Yep. then having any kind of like appreciable impact on the way that that goes is, is heavy. Uh, and it's heavy in a way that's not really compatible with the kind of lighthearted vibe of my channel yeah, or something. Okay. Have you found a way through this like obviously it's a it's a genuine issue and and one that i'm sure many creators face um have you found a way to kind of yeah calm this down or, or reduce its impact i've been trying various things and various things help yeah. and i want to be clear i've been working this whole time i've been making things yeah i just haven't made anything that i feel good about publishing um, yeah i've been trying to shift how i think about it and also do, I've been doing various like other projects that are more uh, amplifying other things that I think should be amplified uh, because that feels safer somehow. Right. Um, so things like AISafety.info, um, which is this big online FAQ, Yep. about AI safety, yep. which um, is like a community edited. It's kind of wiki-like, except we have, um, we have writers who we pay. Um, we do uh, scholarships where people work for three months writing um, material for this site. And the idea of that is whatever your questions about AI safety, you can put them in and we have semantic search. Um, and it's got this cool kind of expanding tab thing where each question you read it and then it has follow-up questions and you can expand those and follow them through. Nice. Um, yeah, and the hope there is like, the other feature that's really useful is you can, the URL contains code for the current like layout of which questions you have and which ones are open and so on. Yep. And that means you can construct your own subset FAQs. You're on a choose your own adventure in AI safety querying. Exactly. So then when people send me a question, because people often email me or whatever, they get in touch with their questions about AI safety. And it's nice. It saves me a lot of time to be able to be like, oh, they're asking about interpretability. Sure. We have like five to 10, whatever answers about interpretability. I'm just going to send them a link to a page that has all of those. Um, uh, and so on. You can have it like tailored to the specific thing people are looking for. And I think that's like, that's kind of a force multiplier on advocacy to have good quality human authored explanations of AI safety concepts that you can easily search and navigate and share. And that will, if somebody asks you to explain a thing, you can link them. Like this is also one of the things that I think my videos are good for. It's one of the like core use cases of my videos is like, ah. Uh, I can't, I don't want to in explain instrumental convergence all over again. I could send someone like the paper 
like some paper on instrumental convergence that they're right. not going to read, or I yeah. could send them a video and they'll actually watch that and then they'll come to understand it. Um, and that helps with advocacy. It's the same thing, but like writing these answers, they're like fairly short form. They're less intimidating than a paper. It's more likely someone will read it. Um, and then also when they're done reading it, it's like, oh, related, related questions. There's a chance to like suck somebody down a rabbit hole yeah. um, and get them much more interested. So asafety.info is something I'm pretty uh, excited by. And then obviously we're going to build a language agent that uses that as its you know, Of course, data some, set. some fine tuning, of course. Of yeah, course, it's, it's right? Logical, like we couldn't not do thing. that. Yeah. Uh, we have a few prototypes. Um, they still hallucinate a little bit more than I was going to say, like I, hope, to. I hope this LM can hallucinate some uh, good, good new solutions to alignment. Huh. Yeah, I mean, maybe, right? Like, <laughs> It's not impossible. There's a, I mean, the, 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 the space has not been fully explored, right? It's non-zero chance you like throw a dart into the space of solutions and find something that it, I, probably that's not like a good solution, but like causes you to have an idea, right? Inspires you to think of, oh, well, that's dumb, but actually maybe if you tweaked it this way. So Rob, um, I, might, I might move us over just to, um, just to, just to, to kind of help the people who are listening who, who are on this kind of verge of maybe trying something out in the world of content creation, right. um, having gone through all of what you've gone through and, and, and reached a considerable level of success, you know, it's, it's, it's great to hear. I mean, not great, but like it's very humanizing to hear that, you know, there are daily challenges. They don't go away just because you've reached a certain level of success. But still, you have actually reached quite a bit of success um, that many people would be kind of wanting to get to as well through their own work. If you're, if you meet someone who's, um, on their way to creating content to better advocate or educate on AI safety, whichever dimension they choose to go out, go at it from, um, what would be some of your kind of top, top advice to some top advice that you'd want to give them? Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, so much depends on like what mistakes a person is making. Um, when I think about, somebody once said to me, and it kind of changed my life, that being good at something doesn't feel like being good at something. It feels like everyone else being inexplicably bad at something. <laughs> and this is like deeply true, right? A lot of people are like, man, I don't know that I'm that, I'm just not that talented. Like, yeah, sure, I'm like better I'm like, I'm talented at like really easy things, but I'm not talented, like the hard things are really, really hard. Other people, they're skilled, they're talented at like really difficult things. Right. It's like, what, what do you think talented means, right? The stuff you think is easy, that's what you're talented at. Um, and so I see people doing, like explaining things, for example, and I often think like, why do you not just explain it like the clear way? And, um, and it's not easy to break down exactly what I'm doing, if that makes sense. So it's like, what mistakes are you making? So like one classic mistake is disrespecting your audience, uh, confusing, um, uh, confusing ignorance and stupidity. Like yeah. you want to, at least if you want to make the kind of thing I'm making, assume that your audience is ignorant, but smart. Right. Um, people often overestimate how much their audience knows, but under, uh, underestimate how much their audience can learn or can pick up. Um, what else? That's really good advice as for any educator. I think you're absolutely on to, on to something there. Also, if you have learned how to do, like if you're an academic, you've learned how to do academic writing, or even if you just learned how to write in school, forget all of that. <laughs> Because it's it's kind of just bad. Um, uh, don't forget to be interesting. What do you what um, do you when you say forget everything you learned about writing? What what's the what's the better way to write? Um. So I often I sometimes meet people who they've like written a paper, and you read it and it's not clear what it's saying. Or you know you can you can fight your way through it, but it's like. It's not fun. And then you meet them in person at some event or whatever, and you say, oh, I was reading your paper about blah, but I'm like confused about this. 
and they say, oh, well, like the way to think about that is with this analogy and it's just kind of like this. And so we did it this way because of this. And I'm like, why isn't that in the paper? Right. Why did you right? write that? Yeah. Like if, if you impromptu can explain the thing very clearly. So there's something about like formality. Yeah. People feel like certain types of argument or certain types of explanation are like not suitable. And then this will extend even when they're giving like a talk, a presentation with slides or whatever. So it's not just writing versus speaking. It's something about there's like a state of mind that you get into when you are explaining a technical idea that like seems to stop people from being able to just explain the thing clearly, even though they totally can. It's a yeah. mindset thing. Yeah, Paul Graham, Paul Graham talks about this because he's a big writer as well. And he talks about it in the context of like, and I know you just said don't, it's not a writing speaking thing, but he says write like you speak because I think in general conversation, not in formal presenting, people tend to speak to kind of explain things in, in simpler, clearer terms. And then you're right, as soon as it's any kind of formality, and I think this is unfortunately uh, incentivized in sometimes in things like peer review, where peer review is quickly reviewing things. If it looks like it kind of fits the style of a paper, they get really excited um, as much as by the substance. But the point yeah. being, speak simply or, or, or kind of write simply and in a clear way like you would just explain to a friend rather than some, some much more formal version. Right. And metaphors, analogies, narrative, mm -hmm. right? Story. This is the other thing. Like if you're writing a paper, you're kind of assuming a captive audience or something. Like the reviewers have been assigned this to review, so they're going to read it. Um, and the assumption is like, oh, you've got these results and people want to understand your results, so they'll read your paper or something like that. Whereas like on YouTube, it's the extreme opposite. Nobody has to watch your video. Right. Um, and so... One thing that people don't understand when writing, and this translates when people are writing blog posts as well, that like the only job of the title, or in this case, you know, the title and the thumbnail, is to get the person to click on the thing, mm. right? That's its only job is to like, without misleading or, you know, any kind of dishonesty, you're just explaining to the person why they might want to watch the video or read the thing right? If your title is just like, I can't think of an example, but like a lot of titles um, are just like such and such method for such and such. Then like I can read that and I have to do quite a lot of work to figure out if that's something that I am interested in reading. And, um, and then the, the, so the point is that the, the title's job is to get people to read the first sentence. The first sentence's job <laughs> is to get people to read the second sentence. Right. Right. And like the, that job is to get people to read the first paragraph. And the first paragraph's job is to get people to read like the next few paragraphs. You have to explain to people. People's time is valuable. People are right. going to be skimming. There's a million different things they could read or watch. Um, and this is not about clickbait, right? <coughs> Because, like, it's the difference between, like, sales and, like, fraud. <laughs> the point is it just, you've you got to imagine when the person first comes across your material, if the, the first question in their mind is, like, should I read this or not? Is this worth my time? Right. And if you don't spend your first moments with them explaining why this is something that they might be interested in spending time on, they have no reason to stay with it, right? There's a hundred other things they could be reading. Um, make the, figure out what it is. Like how is reading this going to benefit the person who's reading it? Or how is watching this video going to benefit the person watching it? Um, and then just like make that clear as early as convenient. Fantastic. Um, by the way, I need to be taking notes and I am taking notes. It's called a podcast, but <laughs> like for my own show, because all of these things are incredibly relevant for, for the content that I'm producing as well. Um, so thank I you. Have, for, I, have, for, I have a bunch more. 
actually, now that I think about it. Do you want to just, do you want to fast round them? I won't, I won't stop you. Yeah. Okay. So, so the other thing is like, uh, there's a specific skill of like rereading something you've written as your audience. You like write the thing and then read it through, but you don't read it through as you. You like right. mentally become someone who's never heard of any of this stuff right. and then read it through. I think a lot of people somehow don't. Um, sometimes I read people's drafts and it's like this thing here, you just start talking about it and you haven't introduced it. And like, I know that you know it, but the reader doesn't know that yet. Right. Um, and that's like, you can kind of do it as you go. I think it also helps to like every now and then just read the whole thing through explicitly with that mental, um, mental attitude. Oh yeah. And I was talking about narrative, like narrative is extremely powerful. Um, and what that means is like, have your thing be a story and you can make up it. Like the story doesn't have to be, say you're explaining some technical thing, some invention, some machine, some yep. technique, whatever. Yep. Um, like how is that a story? It's just yeah. a device that does a thing. Mm -hmm. The story usually is how that thing was invented, right? Because this thing was invented to solve a problem and there was a process there. And it, it doesn't have to be an accurate story of the invention of the thing. It just has to be a plausible story. So like you've got a thing that's like these three parts, there's A, B, and C, and A connects to B like this, and A connects to C like this, and uh, B and C connect like this, and it does the thing, and now that's your device, right? There's yep. your explanation. Boring. Yep. Instead, you say, here's a problem, right? You lay out the problem that this device is supposed to solve. Yep. And you say, oh no, what are we going to do about this problem? Well, the obvious thing to try is this thing A, right? A does it. And then you try throwing A at the problem and you're like, hey, it kind of works, but it breaks because of whatever. And you're like, how do we get around that? Well, maybe if we connect B to A, right? And we, we would have to connect it like this and that would solve that problem. And then you're like, does A, B work? It's like, yeah, kind of, but there's this separate problem that comes up when you do it that way, which like, how do we solve that? Oh, well, what if we did C? And sometimes you could be like, what if we did D? And then D doesn't work. And then you're like, ah, but C does, right? You can like, you know, okay, well, how do we connect C? Well, C would have to be connected like this in order to make sense. And then like, cool, now the whole thing works. And then the person has, firstly, a story, which is like way more memorable. Secondly, they have like uh, a clearer sense of what the like structure of the problem that's trying to be solved and right. why these other things don't work. And like why the thing had to be that way, why it couldn't be another way, what it looks like if you remove any of these components and what goes wrong. They've got like gears, right? They could construct, if they forgot one of the components, they could build it from the remaining pieces they have because they have like an understanding. So it's, it's like, like way good, more memorable. This is, this, is, this is the classic like good teacher, you know, the good teacher who walks you through doesn't just give you some big complicated thing and says, please remember this and show up at the exam, but goes, this build, this was started this way and didn't work quite well. Da, da, da. And that's when you come out the other side with a deep appreciation, understanding and set of connections, like you're saying, to, to remember, remember all those things. Right. And it's also, it pulls you with it because it's a story that actually has like emotional ups and downs. You've right. got like a problem and then you come up with this thing and you think it's great and you try it and it fails and you think harder and you come up with a new thing and there's like a, there's, 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 um, there's highs and lows. There's like a hero's story. journey, there's a hero's journey of a kind or something like that. Right, right. You've got some, and like, that's not, oh, this is the other thing. Uh, aim low, aim lower than you expect that you would need to. Okay. Like. Um, Yudkowsky has a, has a post about this, but that like, basically if you write something that you think is like, I'm going to explain this concept really well for undergrads, then like the people who benefit the most from it are going to be like PhDs and postdocs. And if you're like, I'm going to write something for high schoolers, then like the undergrads and the master's students are going to like get the most out of that. And so, right. um, so 
This is why the explain like I'm five subreddit is so right. Uh, yeah, because it's explain like so I'm five, popular. but it's actually all like thirty five year olds reading it or whatever. Yeah, ad- adults reading it. Right, and that's just like I don't know. It's some kind of social status thing, right? People pretend to understand things that they don't. Um, people um, people pretend to not need explanations. Like everybody, everybody wants to seem smart, and so they tend to act as though harder to follow explanations are sufficient. Whereas, like, if you actually want to explain something to someone, you need to um, you need to just like make it clear. I don't know. Yep. And again, this is the other thing. Children aren't stupid, right? If you're explaining something to an eight-year-old, a smart eight-year-old, they're not dumb. They just right. are inexperienced. Right. They just, there's a lot of things that they don't know, but if you explain it to them, then now they know it. Um, and so explaining something as though you were explaining it to a child, like I give that, I want to give that advice that's like explain it like you're explaining to a child. But I think a lot of people, when they hear that, a lot of people don't respect kids as they, much as I do. They, they, right? or, or they miss something. Like, yeah, they, they use it. In a, yeah, it doesn't quite resonate the way you want it to resonate. Right. Like a smart child. Explain right. it Explain it like, like, a, like a child prodigy who just hasn't come across any of this stuff before. And you could probably like just do it by just cutting out some of the things, the bad things, you know, jargon, um, you, know, a, you know, acronyms, like things like that, which like it's not even about how smart they are. It's just purely domain knowledge uh that you're skipping um and i know some people like i'm broadly pro jargon right like i think if you want to think deeply about a subject you're just like you're going to create new concepts and those concepts need handles and so you need to create terms for those but if you're going to use a term that isn't commonly used you have to explain what it means Right, it had to have right. come up in the in the in the discussion well in advance, or like not in, enough in advance that you're you're not going to trigger, you know, confuse the person. Yeah, and maybe more than once, right? Sometimes people are like, "Oh, I've explained this term, and therefore I can just now use it forever." Like maybe the first few times you use it, like the second time you mention it, you also throw in a quick, just a few sentence, a few a few words to like remind people of what previous explanation that which is term what refers you know, to glossaries and, and links and things like that are so i mean the number of things that i've looked up for the, the thousandth time you know it's it's a normal and natural thing totally. to do yep robert that was an awesome walkthrough of like a ton of different learnings that you've had as an educator um and and i'm sure anybody listening who's to producing any kind of content, which there's a lot of different content out there that people are producing in the world of AI safety, um, can get a huge amount out of that. So, so that's fantastic. So thank you. I, I actually just want to ask you one more question, uh, before we wrap sure. up, but it's, it's a big one, but so, but, but it probably our last question, which is, um, how do you think, uh, AI, the, the path towards, uh, AI alignment and safety is going. You know, you've seen the ecosystem develop over a long period of time. Uh, do you think things are going well? And I guess ultimately, do you think we're on a good path right now to 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 getting to safe outcomes with advanced AI systems? Yeah, I think there's a lot of work which is good so far as it goes, but doesn't tackle the hardest parts of the problem, the things that there's a lot of things that like they are alignment, but they don't really scale. Uh, The things you wouldn't expect to work on like drastically superhuman systems and that kind of thing. And like coming up with the type of stuff which could in principle work with drastically superhuman systems is still way underexplored. Yeah, I think it's good that there are people taking different approaches. The field is still way, way too small. Right. I don't know the numbers, but like we're still talking about hundreds of researchers rather than thousands. Right. Um, until recently, I would have said we're doing better than I would have expected company-wise. Like I think if you re-roll the dice from like the year 2000 or something, I think we probably end up with, by default, I would expect us to end up with AI companies that don't care about safety at all. 
Right. And instead, you have DeepMind, which was like founded uh, explicitly around some of these like AGI safety concerns. Um, OpenAI, similarly, uh, uh, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> well, this week they're literally right, just right. covered in question marks. Uh, yeah. This is a recording in the week of the uh, OpenAI Sam Altman firing. Right. So I don't have any idea what's going on there, but it seems like bad news uh, at the current juncture. Um, but they were founded as a not-for-profit and the, the board obviously has done something which could be because of safety concerns. So, yeah, like get back right. to your point about the rolling of the dice. This definitely does not feel like standard standard uh, commercial company stuff. Right, right. Like, yeah, the default thing I would expect is just AI companies barreling forward towards AGI with no particular concern about safety. Uh, and what we ended up with was better than that. I think the stuff, the, the government stuff is like happening much better than I would have expected. I'm right. really surprised that the UK has like made this such a priority. Yeah. And I think the task force is pretty, pretty amazing. Like very unlikely the average, like if you told me, oh yeah, the government has like put together a task force to deal with AI. My expectation is that that is going to be total bullshit from beginning to end. Right. And like, it's not, it's good people, um, like saying sensible things and like, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Right. Yeah. I'm, it's still a government task force. And so like, really, but they've know, moved fast. I mean, they've, they've moved they've, so fast. They've moved as fast as most, most companies, most startups. So there's a lot of things to yeah. say about it. Yeah. So it's like, firstly, that is well ahead of what I would have expected. It's much better than I would have expected. And yep. secondly, just the fact that it exists at all in advance of a major catastrophe. That's another thing, yeah. We haven't actually I really had would it. Not have, yeah. Like usually this kind of thing happens in response to some disaster. And that we've been able to get this out ahead of that is, uh, again, very unlikely. So it feels as though, I don't know... Um, What's that golfer? Somebody said, you know, it's funny, the, the more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> um, so I don't know to what extent we've been lucky on that front versus that this is all really excellent 4D chess that people have been playing. Um, I think it's a combination. I think people did yeah, well I to mean, like you, yeah, strategically people, position themselves. Right, people so. have put in the work, but, but still like you compare it to governance more generally um, and it feels like we've been able to get people to take this seriously and, and do some, put some real money and, and thought behind it in a way that, yeah, even a year ago, most people weren't predicting. Um, yeah. So it's happened fast. Yeah. So it feels as though we are doing better than average, better than I would have expected us to be doing. However, yep. this is not marked on a curve, right? We're not being graded on a curve. We're being faced with a problem of a certain difficulty, and it may be that we do significantly better than we ought to I'm not, have. I've not heard it described like that. And we still like just that. lose. You're right. Yeah, right? we're not comparing ourselves to how crap could it have been. We're compared to <laughs> did we did we get to a world we were pretty pretty happy with or not? You know, and, and there's only there's it's not quite binary, but it's pretty close. Right. Have we achieved the standard by which we can like reasonably expect? to come out of this okay? No, no, I don't think so. Right. Um, but it doesn't seem impossible that we come out of this okay at this point. Yeah. Which if is encouraging. To, if you had to call out one or two things uh, where you're like, this is just something I'm really hoping, you know, more people pay attention to and maybe work on. A couple of things where you're like, this is the kind of thing people, uh, you, could, you would be excited to see people do more of, what would it be? Um, I want to see more ambitious plans that try to solve the core of the problem. Mm. I actually would like to see more people doing the kind of thing that Mary has been doing. <sighs> the, the, uh, like, I wish that we had more time to build this fundamental stuff up. 
but we might be able to get some of that done with um, just more people. The thing that people don't like, the thing I feel is underappreciated is that like the total amount of like competence weighted human hours mm -hmm. that have been spent trying to tackle this problem is a, a rounding error. It's, it's, it's functionally zero, right? And I don't mean that, I don't mean to, um, to disparage the research community or whatever, mm. but what I mean is it's very small and has only been seriously working on this for like 10 years or so, right? right? For the most part, I like it. more than 10 years ago, it was even smaller. It was like so small that, um, Right. This is yeah, like so this is like geometry and Pythagoras' time before the rest of mathematics was invented or something like that. Right, right. And so if we do have enough time for people to build careers in this, then there are wild careers to be to be built. It's kind of like the analogy I use. I agree. Um Geometry in Pythagoras' time is a, is, a good, is a good metaphor. The other metaphor that I use is um, like biology in the like 1800s, 1700s, yep. where it's just like, oh, oh, you're interested in, uh, in insects? Yeah, we've got a guy who's into insects. Talk to him. He's, all, he, he, you know, he's the insect he's a guy. guy. He's the insect right? guy. Right. Like that's the thing. There are like right. there are fields of alignment where we've just got like a guy or yeah. a couple of guys. Uh, I shouldn't say that actually because it's it's not exclusively guys at all. Um, yeah. But like there's like one person who that's their thing. Yeah, um, and it's it's also kind of like biology in that time frame because it's like oh yeah you, you're into the biology of insects you should get on a boat and just like pick up lots of insects and then like pin them up on a board you know versus we have any kind of understanding of like what makes an insect an insect and like how they relate right. to the rest of the field of biology and them at different, you know, it's like such a, it's like right now we're looking like when we talk about, you know, uh, deception, we're like, Oh, let's find an example of deception. It's like, so, so limited versus obviously the depth with which we expect to understand these things, you know, in the yeah, in years so and early. decades to come. Yeah. Um, and then it's, yeah. How early are we relative to uh, capabilities development? Sure. It's unsettling. But, uh, you know, yeah, there's two sides of a coin, right? Of uh, crisis and opportunity or something like that. Mm. If you do want to work on this stuff, there are vast swathes of territory that you can claim if you're good. Yes. Yes. Fantastic, Robert. I think that's a, that's a really good place to, to pause um, in that you've talked about kind of the things that you're really optimistic and, and happy about, but also the things that we need to do better on. Um, so let's pause there. Uh, did you have any last comments uh, or thoughts for our listeners? I, you were asking me what I was working on. And I was talking about the, the main channel and how that's um, been for me recently, psychologically and all of that stuff. Um, and then I talked about AISafety.info. Uh, but there's a few other things as well. Um, so I have this channel, AI Safety Talks, where I'm hosting, um, well, AI Safety Talks. But the idea is this is like long form academic, you know, presentations. Um, I just recently got back from the Bay where I was like, I made these kits, these like, uh, recording kits with, uh, you know, suitable equipment to get high quality recordings of talks. And I've, I made three of those and deposited them, uh, at various, uh, locations yep. where these organizations are based. So I, I when... used one of them. I, I gave a talk with one of you. Oh, you've used talk. one. Well, it was, yeah, nice. you were the one, you were the one who, who, who encouraged me to use it when I gave a talk right. at Far Labs. Yeah. So there's one at Far, there's one at, uh, Lighthaven and there's one at, uh, where's the other one? Constellation, maybe? Constellation, yeah. Um, and so, but yeah, there's a YouTube channel, Air Safety Talks. If you're interested in high quality, hopefully now, uh, high quality recorded talks from AI safety researchers that's like up to date, if you want to get 
spend a little bit more time, get into a little bit more technical detail than happens on my channel. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And I'm also launching a project soon, which I'm calling probably like Rob Miles reading list, or something like that, which is just okay. me reading out loud things that I was going to read anyway. Um, <laughs> but just so like basically the, just the audio, the audio book version of, of like stuff that's your reading in AI safety. Yeah, exactly. So that's going right. to be papers, articles and stuff like that. And I'll do screen capture as well. That'll be a YouTube channel and a podcast. So if you just want to get, if you're like, hmm, I would like to do a bit more reading about AI safety, but I don't have time or whatever I want to, I want to do it while I'm doing the dishes. Um, then yeah, that's, that's coming up. I've recorded a few of those. Fantastic. Um, I'll make sure all, of, I'll, I'll make sure all of these are in the show links for people to discover as well. Nice. Awesome. Well then we'll, we'll wrap up there. Thank you Rob for, for all of the incredible work you've been doing to, uh, educate a generation of AI safety folks and continuing that. Um, it's really inspiring. It's incredibly impactful and yeah we're really excited to see everything else you produce even if if it can be scary sometimes uh, which we sure. all feel um, uh, we all have those challenges i'm incredibly excited for all the things you're doing next and incredibly excited to see what our audience members um, do with 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 what you've shared and, and and their work in ai safety as well so we'll pause there thank you so much rob thank you